Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 123, What's Disney Without Mickey? Uh, I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my informative and entertaining co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, dear? I'm tired. How are you? <laughs> I'm right there with you. So we, we're a week off here. Yeah. Uh, we were scheduled originally to shoot last Wednesday. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, we had tornadoes that were blowing through our area. Yeah. We kind of decided not to to do the podcast because of that. (laughs) As a result of that, there were events that were scheduled for the next day. Right. That threw our schedule off because they got pushed until Friday. And then the weekend showed up and nobody wanted to do anything on the weekend. Yeah, it was a holiday weekend too. So we just kind of wanted to... Relax. Oh, and school started this week. So, you know, all that. I will have a very interesting discussion with our daughter tomorrow on tomorrow's podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, we didn't podcast last this week. Last week, uh, we'll chalk that up to an act of God. Yep, sure uh, was. God didn't want us <laughs> podcasting, so we didn't. He said, "Stay in the basement and watch the news." Yeah, with and, everyone and else, we did. We were glued to. It. We did get to see uh, the cloud go by on the uh, yeah, security yeah, camera, was, which was scary. It was very scary how close it it came. So. so, but we're back this week. Mm-hmm. We were very fortunate. We did not get any uh, damage, no injuries. Um, so we were, and it, it only blew by about two miles away from us it, yeah. on the other side of our town. So, yeah, yeah. Very, very close call. Mm-hmm. But we're back this week and we are talking about Disney and Star Wars and all the other stuff that we talk about. So, in today's Disney Detective, some details on the reimagining of Splash Mountain. And is Disney losing Mickey Mouse? No! Maybe. Maybe. Kind of. Eh, sort of. Maybe. Eh. Then in our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, a props bonanza at Walt Disney Archives, and Star Wars fans suddenly wish that Luke Skywalker cameo didn't actually happen. The fickle bunch that they are. Poopoo heads. One of which I count myself <laughs> Yes, you are. And for our entertainment news, the stars of Cobra Kai, Cobra Kai, react <laughs> to a season five announcement and then the honoring of Chadwick Boseman's legacy. And as always, we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week and some afterthoughts that uh, next week you said we'll start ticking those off the list. Yeah, because they're finally, finally coming up to them. So. Which is nice. Yeah. But before we do that, I would appeal to our audience, uh, both our listening and our viewing audience, to subscribe to the podcast. You can get audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Entertainment. And video versions of all the network's podcasts are listed as Insights into Things on Google, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon, etc., etc. Any place you can get a podcast, basically. I would also ask you to... Right in, give us your feedback, tell us how we're doing. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can hit us on Twitter at insights underscore things. We're at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast or instagram.com slash insights into things. Or you can get links to all those on our website at insights into things.com. Are we ready to get started? Sure. All righty. <laughs> Oh, 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 
go for Disney Detective. So our first story comes from D23.com. And as we previously discussed on the podcast, Walt Disney Imagineering's plan to reimagine Splash Mountain at Disneyland and Disney World Resorts. So the intent was to bring new theming inspired by the beloved Walt Disney Animation Studios film, The Princess and the Frog, to the ride. So recently, the team at D23, which is the official Disney fan club, discussed the changes with Bob Weiss, who happens to be the president of Walt Disney Imagineering. So the results of that interview were published recently on the club's website in an August 23rd post. In the talk, some of the very first details were uh, revealed about the attraction. So the theme of the new attraction centers around Tiana's first ever Mardi Gras performance. Now, so much goes into the creative process behind the attractions, including in-depth research to spark inspiration. So for this upcoming attraction, Imagineers dug deep into the culture of New Orleans, which is the city that Tiana calls home, in order to craft a story authentic to both the region and to the characters. So, so much makes New Orleans a distinct and unique city, from the food, the music, the art, the architecture, and the diversity of its people and their traditions. There's just so much which the Imagineers could find inspiration from. So one of the early inspirations was from a visual artist, uh, Shakira Mandy. Um, and Mandy is an art educator and alumni of the renowned, uh, I guess it's Yaya. I don't know. Right. Uh, so it's the Young uh, Aspirations Young Artists Incorporated Art Center, which is located in New Orleans. So to help inspire the Imagineers, uh, Mandy was commissioned to create a series of four original paintings to inspire the Imagineers. The Walt Disney Company recently announced that they uh, were making a $50,000 donation to uh, NOCCA, which is the New Orleans Center for the Creative Arts. Uh, it's a regional pre-professional arts training center that offers students instruction in culinary, dance, media, music, theater, visual, and creative writing arts. Uh, the donation was meant to celebrate the inspiration that the region provides uh, to the new attraction, Disney's love for the city of New Orleans and the company's commitment to the arts and education. Um, so if you can't get enough of Princess Tiana, there's so much more uh, about her story, which is going to be coming out. Um, one of the things is that the new uh, Disney Cruise Line ship, the Disney Wish, which will be uh, starting to hopefully set sail next year, is going to have a new lounge based on her theme called The Bayou. And then there is also an animated series that's going to be coming to Disney Plus uh, called Tiana. That's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, 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 there's no secret that I bash Disney when they deserve to be bashed on the really? show. <laughs> but only when they deserve it. And, right, you know, no. Rightly so, it. they deserve it quite a lot mm -hmm. these days. Um, but this is one of those situations where it's it's nice to see that they're not just – culturally appropriating things and right. profiting off of it. They're mm -hmm. giving back to the community. Mm -hmm. They're recognizing the community. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a very different side of Disney that we're seeing with this particular thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they're changing the ride for all the right reasons. Mm -hmm. And they're doing it with a modern take on a, a princess that represents a whole new segment of the, the population. Right, because they could have totally just – taken out song of the south and just exactly it's a bunch of animals right you know and not given it any movie tie-in or, or anything and here as is a princess who you know has a great story has a great background and uh you know doesn't necessarily need a prince to make her her dreams come true because she was doing everything on her right. own and yeah she's a great inspiration the character yeah. itself is a great inspiration and it's representative of a segment that's mm -hmm. that's all too often underrepresented yeah. in entertainment. Yeah. So kudos so, to them. Very cool. Mm -hmm. So 
the burning question, will Disney lose the rights to Mickey Mouse? Let's talk about that one. I don't know. So when you think of Disney, there are a few iconic images that come to mind. Perhaps a castle or maybe a favorite princess. But one thing is universally known as... But one thing that is universally known as Disney is Mickey Mouse. So from the days of Steamboat Willie... Walt's uh, debut of his little pal Mickey Mouse has been the mascot of Disney. But now it seems that Disney is at risk of losing the rights to the character. So according to The Hollywood Reporter, the copyright for Walt Disney's 1928 cartoon Steamboat Willie, which introduced the world to Mickey Mouse, is set to expire and enter the public domain in three years. So the rights would include the Mickey Mouse that we saw in the film, which is different from other iterations of the character as time progressed. So the Hollywood Reporter went on to explain how Disney avoided this happening earlier. Disney had successfully lobbied Congress to lengthen the number of years that copyrights can be held in 1988. The law ended up being called the Copyright Term Extension Act, but has also received the name the Mickey Mouse Protection Act. However, in three years, the rights to Mickey Mouse will end and Mickey will end up for grabs. So it seems that Disney's legal team might succeed in keeping Walt Disney's favorite character, famous character, and the Mouse House mascot from becoming free rights, just as others have done with Dracula or Sherlock Holmes. If not, however, another company is basically ready to eat Disney alive. The Hollywood Reporter announced that a company called Mischief, uh, spelled M-S-C-H-F, has launched its ex-famous mouse. So the company's ad copy doesn't call the token Mickey Mouse or use its exact imagery for now, but it's kind of a placeholder for the iconic character and comes with a unique ticking clock. The idea is that you pay for a nondescript mouse-like token today, the cost of $100 for one of the 1,000 copies available, and then you'll receive a physical collectible token for uh, for the character that's redeemable in 2024 when Disney's copyright on Mickey Mouse is set to expire. And then at that time, you'll receive the real deal. So Mischief CEO Gabe uh, Whaley is clearly not a fan of Disney, as he has stated. He has said, Disney is a massive, all-swallowing conglomerate with a desire for both industry dominance and cultural homogeny. It is ever-growing, ever-encompassing, risk-averse, and society uh, blandering. We must leap at the chance to take back even the scant morsels available to, to us at the slightest chance we must eat them alive. I don't think he really likes them. <laughs> I, I can't imagine why you would think that. Yeah. So if Disney does gain the rights to Mickey Mouse, his token would likely be void. Uh, the idea of creating the coin while Disney still owns the rights may not have been the best move on his part. A copyright uh, attorney discussed the situation, and it seems that Disney could have legal grounds to actually sue the company. Um They said it's difficult to foresee a scenario where art of a not yet public domain work could not give rise to a uh, prospective claim. Disney can credibly argue that the uh, in uh, Cockret license. I think I spelled that phonetically, didn't I? Yeah, you did. Incoet. Incoet? Incoet. Okay, license devalues the current value of its licensing right by um, diverting uh, would-be licenses. Um, It should be noted that even if Disney were to lose the trademark of the original Mickey Mouse, Disney would still own copyrights for later incarnations of the character and Mickey-related trademarks. So it'll take a few years to see what happens with Disney and the original Mickey Mouse. See, now, I didn't bash Disney on the last story, but I'm going to bash him on this one. Sure, go right ahead. Disney basically strong-armed their way in the legislation so that they could protect their one thing. Mm-hmm. And they basically bought the politicians that they needed to do this, which, I mean, welcome to America. That's what all corporations do. Right. However, by doing that, 
they did it with the intent to protect their own, but it had far reaching consequences through the entire copyright industry. Mm -hmm. So you have works of art, like compositions, music compositions Mm -hmm. that have not been able to enter the public domain because of Disney. Mm. And it had nothing to do with Mickey Mouse. So Disney's basically held a stranglehold on the copyright industry for the last 30-some, 40-some years now just because they didn't want to give up the rights to Mickey Mouse. When we all know that this incarnation of Mickey Mouse that we're seeing here that's one of the earliest versions of Mickey Mouse Mm -hmm. is really only a short period of time in the copyright history of the mouse. Yeah. And if they lost this, no one's going to identify this mouse as anyone other than Mickey Mouse. Absolutely. Or associated with anyone other than Disney. Mm -hmm. So by fiat, they basically have a monopoly on this character. And that's really what should be argued in this case here is that no one's ever going to confuse that as somebody else's mouse. Right. So I don't have a problem if they continue to own the copyright to that. But don't affect the entire copyright industry because of that. The fact that our politicians allowed that to happen and basically allowed Disney to buy that le- legislation back in the 1980s is is inconceivable to me. You know, the fact that you can do that, an, a, a company can do that for one purpose and then it affect everything globally is, well, within the United States – It's idiotic. It really is. And Disney did it with a strong arm tactic, not caring who else it affected. You know, you have artists that aren't, their estates are not collecting any revenue on a lot of these things anymore, but they legally can't put it up into the public domain, even if they want to, Mm. because of Disney. So this is one area where Disney really needs to stay away from trying to get legislation passed. They're not politicians. They may own their own country down in Florida, with a Navy that's bigger than most third world countries, but they shouldn't be trying to pass legislation on their own because they're not going to do it right. Not that our politicians do either. Yeah, well. But anyway, that's my soapbox ran on Disney for this week. Okay. I kept it brief, didn't I? Yeah, that was good. All right. not, not bad at all. So that was all we had for our Disney detective. Mm-hmm. We'll be back shortly with our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. For seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Go for Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. So the Walt Disney Archives recently received multiple large trailer fulls of significant props from the most recent Star Wars films, including The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, The Rise of Skywalker, Rogue One, and Solo. Uh, The containers are full of costumes, props, and set decorations that were uh, actually used during pre-production and filming, and the vast majority appeared on screen, says Rick uh, Loritz, who uh, is the acquisitions manager for the Walt Disney Archives. Among the collection are a large-size X-Wing Starfighter, an A-Wing, and the cockpit set of the Millennium Falcon. So aside from the films, most of these items have rarely, if ever, been seen except uh, aside from the occasional Star Wars Celebration or D23 Expo. So the 2019 D23 Expo featured an impressive retrospect called The Evolution of the Stormtrooper, which included the wildly popular Sith 
Stormtrooper, which is featured in Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker, uh, the final film of the Skywalker saga. So keeping track of these otherworldly collections and making sure it safely arrives at its new home in the Walt Disney uh, archives is not an easy task. So with Doc Ondor's busy tending to his own collectibles and creatures in his den of antiquities at Black Spire Outpost, the job of overseeing this collection transition uh, falls on Madeline Moskowitz, uh, the Lucasfilm's collections and exhibitions archivists say that five times fast so as the cons- as the custodian of stolen plans or mm, star wars props artifacts and costumes uh, she herself is also making the journey from a galaxy far far away to join the walt disney archives she had said i'm very excited to join i'll be part of the research team working directly with kevin kern it'll be a good point of contact for all things lucas films So in addition to the thousands of props already sent to the archives, all future Lucasfilm live-action productions will likely yield additional treasures for the collection. But with such a vast and expanding galaxy to explore, how does the archive team determine what to keep? She had said, In deciding what items we collect and preserve, we want to represent the creative process and the story itself. She says archivists look at the costumes that represent the main characters or a number of creatures who have been predominantly featured in the films or more recently on the Disney Plus live action series, The Mandalorian. She says, I definitely have an unusual job. Uh, It might seem like a gargantuan task to um, adequately preserve the touch points and important props of one of the most significant film franchises in motion picture history. But for now, she says, uh, herself and the rest of the team are excited to finally bring these items to the Walt Disney archives, such as Luke's X-Wing, the Falcon seating area, and obviously all those droids. So suddenly we're not so far, far away anymore. And we can't wait to see them all. And, you know, they need to do something. You either need a traveling exhibit. Yes, I agree. Or you need a behind-the-scenes look at the props and go through the Mm -hmm. things. Because I would love to see the creative process in creating these things. Mm -hmm. Where does the inspiration come from? What's the process look like? Right. They had the one prop show on Disney Plus that we love where Mm -hmm. they were hunting down lost props and stuff. And that was really cool to see that. And you get the history of the props. But I would love to see them open up the archives mm, and yeah. just just take cameras through and show mm-hmm. you this stuff and talk about it. And, and I'm bring surprised it out. that they haven't done anything like that over the years. Because, yeah, you've gotten little glimpse here and there uh, right. of things, but never like a real full-fledged tour right. you know of it and i could understand you don't want people in it because you don't want people touching certain things or whatever but now especially now that you have disney plus yeah you could do hours upon hours of that you that know and be... not just star wars because star wars could be its own series yeah. of just all yeah. the star wars props that you have and the history behind it and you know who made this and you know this was the first version of something and you know this was the last version of something or this was a version that we never even used just like the x-wing i mean to look at the differences in the Mm x-wing from a new hope until last jedi or rise of skywalker would just be awesome to see that evolution and Mm -hmm. see how they decided to change things and modernize them and um, so Disney, if anyone from Disney is listening, you've got a show right there that's a guaranteed hit. Absolutely. Even if you even if you don't do Disney props and just do Star Wars, that's like ten seasons right there. <laughs> totally. Ten seasons. <laughs> ten seasons, I say. <laughs> and that comes from a fickle Star Wars fan who was one of many who I don't actually wish that the Luke Skywalker cameo didn't happen, but some did. Let's talk about that. Yeah, so when the Disney Gallery, the Mandalorian Luke Skywalker special, dropped la- uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Star Wars fans were in for a treat and an insightful pick. Hmm. <laughs> Teasers. Uh, the installment gave a special behind-the-scenes look at the making of the Season 2 finale episode, Chapter 16, The Rescue, which saw Jedi... 
Knight, Luke Skywalker, the CGI version of Mark Hamill, return to the Star Wars universe just after the original trilogy error. Um, so The Mandalorian, for those who don't know, is set about five years after George Lucas's Star Wars Return of the Jedi. In addition to Hamill comparing the return of his iconic Star Wars character to James Bond, one of the most interesting tidbits that was shared in the Disney Gallery, the Mandalorian episode, was the fact that Chapter 16 director Peyton Reed, executive producer Dave Filoni, showrunner John Favreau, and others on the production crew developed an elaborate hoax to, concede, uh, to convince fans that Skywalker wasn't actually the Jedi coming back to the Star Wars story. To accomplish this, they commissioned elaborate concept art featuring a fan favorite prequel trilogy and Star Wars Clone Wars character Plo Koon. Koon's return would have made sense, specifically connecting to the Filoni-directed Season 2 episode uh, 5, Chapter 13, The Jedi, in which Star Wars Clone Wars fan favorite Ahsoka Tana made her live-action debut. So Clune, after all, was the Jedi who first found the three-year-old Ahsoka on her home world, and the two maintained a special bond, bringing the one who found her, Plune, took her to the Jedi Temple, where she was then raised to learn the ways of the Jedi. And throughout their bond, Plo Koon affectionately called her Little Soka, and Ahsoka uh, called him Master Plu. Uh, as it turns out, many fans also have an attachment to Ahsoka's uh, savior, and some of them wish that Clune had come back to Star Wars instead of Mark Hamill's Skywalker. So in light of the news that Kloon uh, was used as a red herring, fans have been launching a social media campaign asking Disney and Lucasfilms to create an actual Plo Koon series. But they basically said he was never meant to be on the show. They literally explained it all. He was used as a placeholder to hide Luke's cameo. He was never meant to show up. So as for Luke Skywalker, his return came at a perfect moment in the Mandalorian saga. He swooped in with his X-Wing and a green lightsaber just in time to save uh, Din Djarin. Uh, Grogu- I know, I totally screwed that up. Din Djarin. <laughs> Din Djarin, I'm sorry. Din Djarin. Star Wars Star names. Star Wars names really don't work with you. <laughs> they don't. They so don't. Grogu uh, and company from Moff Gideon. Played by who? <laughs> Juan Carlos. <laughs> you know what? Giancarlo Esposito. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to get that on my... You know. And his dark trooper squad. Jerk. <laughs> <laughs> and now the character is expected to return. A recent poster teased him making a yellow lightsaber with Grogu as the foundling commences his Jedi Order training. That return is expected in The Mandalorian Season 3, Ahsoka, or The Book of Boba Fett, or even the rumored Luke Skywalker series that currently remains unconfirmed. So, yeah, it was... <clears throat> it was Cool. I don't know why people were upset. I mean, people were like on Twitter, literally upset that it was Luke Skywalker. Where I was like as happy as could be and crying happy tears that it was yeah. Luke Skywalker. Well, and like everyone saw Plo Koon die in Revenge of the Sith. So you kind of knew it wasn't going to be him. Like you literally see him shot down and, and his Schweider crash. Like. If anyone's going to make it out of Revenge of the Sith, it's probably going to be someone like Samuel L. Jackson's Mace Windu character. Okay, right. I could see that. Had his arm chopped off, was electrocuted, and thrown out a window. But you already saw him survive a massive fall in Attack of the Clones. Mm. So he's probably alive. I Somewhere. Don't, I don't think Plo Koon is. Well, you never know. You never know, but he's probably dead. Anyway. That's all we had for our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy this week. We'll be back momentarily with our, uh, not our insightful picks. We still have another segment to do. We'll be back our with entertainment our entertainment news. news of the week. I'm jumping the gun here. <laughs>
Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com on the web at insightsintothings.com. Go for entertainment news. So Cobra Kai's fourth season won't even debut on Netflix until December, but the streamer announced last week that the popular series will be back for a fifth season and series stars William Zapka and Ralph Macchio both uh, had reacted to the news, sharing their excitement on social media. So both actors shared a short video clip that also was shared by the show's official Twitter to celebrate the next chapter in the continuation of the iconic the Karate Kid film franchise. Thank you, fans, uh, Machio said. More story coming to you. Cobra Kai series uh, season five starts filming soon. Uh, Zapka, for his part, shared the same sentiment on the official account that the dojo is about to be five times as rad. Cobra Kai has been renewed for season five. So Cobra Kai is set over three decades after the events of the 1984 All-Valley Karate Tournament with the continuation of the conflict between Machio's Daniel LaRusso and Zapka's Johnny uh, Lawrence. With season four due out in December, it's currently unclear where season four and season five will take the series. But the series co-creator uh, John Hurwitz uh, suggested earlier this year that there was a lot more story to tell. He said, we've always had a set end game and as to where the story's going, but we've said from the beginning that we weren't exactly sure how many seasons it'll take to get there. We found even in season one that when we were in the writer's room, there were so many ideas that we had that we just didn't fit that they didn't fit into the five hours of the first season, so they ended up being pushed into the next season. Then there were ideas that we talked about uh, at the beginning of the show that showed up in season three that now are going to show up in season four. And then there are ideas that just kind of fell by the wayside. So there's no added pressure to elongate the series. We're still having a blast making it. There is still a lot more story to tell in our minds. We just finished shooting season four and we have a lot more that we're excited to do. So we can't tell you exactly how many seasons we're going to have, but we know that we're going to enter each season with enthusiasm and confidence. Eventually, we'll talk to our friends at Sony and Netflix and say, we think this is probably around the time we should be winding it down and hopefully they'll give us the time to do it. So we'll see. So Cobra Kai Season 4 will arrive on Netflix in December. The one encouraging thing that I took away from this is that they had an endgame in mind when they put this whole plot Mm -hmm. series together. Yep. And I could see how they may have gone in different directions. They may have added some additional drama to it, Mm -hmm. a little more relationship stuff. But they kind of knew where they were going. They didn't just sort of start down this idea. Right, and just kind of go with it and and say, yeah. And it also sounds like they're being given the runway in order to tell this whole Mm -hmm. story. And they're basically calling the shots as to when the story is done. Mm -hmm. Which means you're not going to, hopefully, you're not going to have it canceled in the middle of the story without an ending. Right, right. which Which is an encouraging thing. Yeah, and fortunately, each season hasn't been like a full year because you you know you also get to the point where they're high school kids right so you can only be in high school too quickly for so long but usually each you know it's like usually two seasons or or kind of almost a year or not even because they're usually only 10 you know episodes so it's not so they can kind of elongate it but then you have to be careful again because you do have 
you know, young actors that they don't all of a sudden look too old well, for the part. Well, and if anyone so, can sympathize with that, that Ralph Macchio be Ralph can. Because he was like 30 when he right, started filming. Right. <laughs> and he looks like he's like 20 now. Right. So. He he hasn't aged he looks at all. Incredible. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, and, and, you know, we both like the, the show because yeah. it kind of, tu- it hits on all those touch points. It's mm-hmm. a little campy. It's modernized. But it's campy in a it, good way. Right. Like they're not, they're not relying on the past or letting the past feed the present, mm-hmm. um, which is really nice, especially some of the stuff they did with the trip to Japan last mm-hmm. season right. and how they played that out and saving the business. And it's very clever the way that they're doing these mm-hmm. things. And it's it's not one of these where, oh, well, of course you're going to do that because, you know, you're going to you're gonna wax the cars, right? You got to do that. Right. And, but they haven't waxed a car yet. Nope. You know, there's references to it. There's there's flashbacks to it. Right. There's jokes about it. Like, right. why am I going to do that? Right. You know? Right. So it's really clever, cleverly done the mm-hmm. way they do it. I, I give full props to the creators. For yeah. That. Yeah. Speaking of f- full props, Marvel has decided to honor Chadwick Boseman. How'd they do that? Yeah. So in the second episode of Marvel Studios animated series, What If, which is now streaming on Disney+, Plus, the late Chadwick Boseman reprises his role as T'Challa. So the actor originated the role in the live action feature film Captain America Civil War in 2016. He returned for Black Panther and Avengers Affinity War in 2018, as well as Avengers Endgame in 2019. But what if marks the first time Bozeman voiced the character in an animated project? Sadly, it also marks the last time that the actor got to bring T'Challa to life before his tragic passing last year. He was so gracious, executive producer uh, Brad Wendermar uh, tells D23, we were so fortunate to have him record the series. He reprised the role of T'Challa in at least four of the different states, uh, I'm sorry, in at least four episodes in different versions of the character reimagined because of the different states of the universe. He had. We had no idea at the time when he was recording with us that this would be his final performance as the character. It was such an honor to have had him record, to have his presence in the show. His performance has the same depth and the same impact that it does in live action. He uh, alleviates the material in an incredible way. We were so humbled. In the episode of What If, T'Challa, the young prince of Wakanda, is accidentally abducted by Yondu and becomes a Ravager. Uh, Known as Star-Lord throughout the galaxy, his reputation precedes him, which comes in handy when he crosses paths with the likes of Thanos, uh, Nebula, and uh, Kor... Korath. Korath the Punisher, just to name a few. Pursuer. Pursuer, sorry. Um, T'Challa is interesting because he's not a character who arcs himself. The head writer and executive producer A.C. Bradley said during a recent virtual press conference for What If. He said he's a character who changes the world around him. He doesn't go through a transformation. He transforms the world. So how would T'Challa transform outer space? Well, director and producer... Uh, executive producer Brian Andrews had said he was eager to work with Bozeman on what would un- ultimately be the actor's final performance of as T'Challa. He said he was amazing. We only got a moment because our episodes are so short compared to everyone who was able to enjoy his presence on Black Panther or even Civil War. We had him for a moment to do our thing and we're so grateful for it. He was actually one of the first actors to sign on and say, oh, yeah, I'm going to do that voice. Uh, We were so excited because we really, really wanted to work with Chadwick and we loved Black Panther. Jeffrey Wright, who voices the Watcher, said that he had met Bozeman several years ago at Comic-Con and had hoped to work with him ever since. He said it was a lovely surprise to find out that we would have the opportunity at least to be in the same space with What If?, um, this being his last performance, I find it very moving. I think this was probably a great tribute to, to the actor himself. Mm-hmm. And the episode itself is because the episode kind of really embodies the spirit of the character that he brought to life. 
Definitely. And you look back on it, and there are some characters that you can't see a different actor playing. Like, Mm -hmm. you couldn't see anybody but Robert Downey Jr. playing Iron Man. Right. I can't see anybody playing T'Challa other than Chadwick Boseman yeah. at this point. He just owned the character. And and that was one of the things, too. After he passed away, fans were like, please don't replace him. Right. Uh, there needs to be a new Black Panther in the storyline, but you can't have somebody else come in and, and fill his yeah. role. And, and he embodied the character in real life with mm-hmm. the way that he – portrayed himself the way that his charitable nature Mm -hmm. you know the fact that he was so helpful to up-and-coming actors Mm -hmm. so grateful to the people that gave him his start Mm -hmm. he really embodied everything that that character was Mm -hmm. and you you look at the character and and they're one in the same almost yeah Uh, so it was very nice to see the the touching tribute that they did Mm -hmm. Uh, that was all we had for our Entertainment news this week. Yep. We'll be right back with our insightful picks of the week. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick. P- p- <laughs> my insightful pick of the week is a 2015 gothic romance uh, called Crimson Peak. Uh, it was directed by Guillermo del Toro, uh, written by Toro and Matthew Robbins. Uh, the film stars, uh, I'm probably going to mess up everybody's name, so the only one I'll tell you is Tom Hiddleston uh, and Jessica Chastain, uh, Jim Beaver. Um, so the story is set in Victorian era England and follows an aspiring author who travels to a remote Gothic mansion in the English hills with her new husband and his sister. There she must decipher the mystery behind the ghostly visions that haunt her new home. Um, it was funny because people were actually talking about this, um, Because of the set design and how it has a very haunted mansion look to it. Um, It is that kind of boo, scare you type of horror movie. You know, a little bit of gore uh, here too. But it's a little bit of a a mystery as well. Like you kind of know where it's going, but you're not really... 100% 100% sure in, until the end. So it's kind of that suspenseful, uh, scare you type uh, horror movie. But again, beautiful sets. If if you like that kind of gothic, um, almost steampunk in a way, Victorian style. Um, and to see, you know, Tom Hiddleston is kind of a, a, a jerk <laughs> character. Like you think he's all loving and, you know... Surprise, he's not, but is he, you know, and, and you know, various ghosts that kind of come and, and are giving hints to, to help this bride kind of survive the, the mansion and stuff. So if you're into, you know, spooky horror things, we're coming on the Halloween season. Not a bad movie to, uh, to watch, and it's on Netflix, so. Cool pick. Thank you. So my pick this week, in case you missed the foreshadowing from our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, is Disney Gallery Mandalorian Season 2 Finale. I had no idea. I know. It comes as a real shocker, doesn't it? (laughs) In last year's Season 2 Finale, The Mandalorian, the appearance of a young Luke Skywalker was one of the biggest reveals and best-kept secrets of the acclaimed show thus far. Reaction to the episode was emotionally charged for many, deeply resonating with generations of fans who were elated to see the Jedi Master in his post-Star Wars Return of the Jedi Prime. The story of the cutting-edge technology used to bring back to bring Luke back is the subject of a special extra episode of Disney Gallery, uh, gallery Star Wars The Mandalorian, which the show debuted, the actual uh, documentary debuted on August 25th on Disney+. Plus. Making of the Season 2 finale is a behind-the-scenes look at the making of the celebrated chapter of The Mandalorian, with a focus on the technology used for recreating Luke Skywalker. 
It delves into the collaborative process, including working with Mark Hamill, to create an authentic and fitting recreation and explores the immense pressure and responsibility the filmmakers had in bringing back one of the most important characters in film history. Disney Gallery of the Mandalorian was an insightful pick previously for both its Season 1 and Season 2 documentaries on the Mandalorian, so I, I've gone to the well a few times on this one here because it's a really good show. Yeah. We've enjoyed all of what the series has had to offer so far, but this episode was a little extra special because of the subject. In watching the final season of, uh, final episode of season two, I had already read the spoilers, as I often do. I knew what was going to happen, who it was going to be, and how it was going to happen. Even going into the episode with that foreknowledge, I still couldn't help but get choked up for the last ten minutes or so of the episode. Going into the making of the episode, you'd think I'd gotten rid of all that giddiness, right? But no. I was an 11-year-old little boy once again reliving all the memories and emotions of my youth pretty much through the entire episode of the documentary. As with the previous episodes, the documentary, uh, they managed to capture the behind-the-scenes feel just right. You get the passion and emotion of the producers, directors, actors, and the effects people, which in and of itself is infectious. You get to see the different options for de-aging Mark Hamill, as explained in plain English by John Favreau, because it's a very technical process. You're given a peek behind the curtain at the ta challenges of keeping the secret and the deceptions, which we already talked about. And you also get to see the uh, filming of the scenes from different angles, and then you get to relive, relive the giddiness all over again with that last scene. Now, it's also worth noting that the Television Academy recognized the second season of The Mandalorian with 24 Emmy Award nominations, including Best Drama Series, all of which were well-deserved. So my pick this week is Disney Gallery Mandalorian, the Season 2 finale on Disney+. Plus. And we'll be right back with our afterthoughts. Afterthoughts. All right. So this Saturday is the free toy show, uh, which is in the Sicklerville area at the Carnival of Collectibles. Again, the just the Carnival of Collectibles is a very interesting and unique place to go and kind of explore because you never know what kind of stuff you're going to find, but they're going to have a bunch of tables set up for a toy show as well. Um, then in a couple of weeks... Um, also from toyshow.org is the Delaware train show and the Oktoberfest toy show, October 9th and October 10th at the Nurse Shrine Center in Newcastle, Delaware. Then in two weeks from this weekend is... RetroCon! Uh, September 25th and 26th at the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center in Oaks. Also that weekend in Hunt Valley, Maryland, is Monster Mania 47. Then Monster Mania 48 will be coming to the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center in Oaks, October 22nd through the 24th. The first weekend in October is Brickfest, also at the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center. So if you are into Legos and building and all things brick, this is definitely the event for you. See, the Greater Expo, Greater Philadelphia Expo Center is greater now just because so much stuff is there. Yeah, pretty it's much. <laughs> not just because they say it's greater. Yeah, pretty much almost every weekend there's probably something, you know, going on. They sometimes have golf expos. There's usually a psychic fair expo. Uh, the psychic fair? We should go to that. We've never gone to that one. That sounds like it'd be interesting. Would you really go to that? Yeah, that would be kind of cool. Okay. Because I'd go. Yeah. I think that'd be neat. <laughs> okay. I think the one time we went... It was going on one of the other halls. Yeah, I can't remember what... Was it when we went to Breakfast that it was I going think it on? was. Because that was when they... Because they have like yeah. four different entrances. Yeah, it's massive, so, But they yeah. all open up into, the, into one big into one. Into one big one if they want it to. So, yeah. Yeah, that would be kind of interesting. Okay, if we we'll have to that. look. But anyway, 
I think that's it for today. Before mm-hmm. we do go, I would invite our audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can subscribe to the audio version of this podcast listed as insights and entertainment or the video version of all of our podcasts listed as insights into things on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, et cetera, et cetera. I would also invite you to email us, contact us, give us your own shows that we can plug for you here so we can get them out there and get more people going to these things. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us at Twitter at insights underscore things. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. You can find us on instagram.com backslash insights into things. Audio versions of this podcast can be found on the web at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. You can find the video versions of all of our podcasts at youtube.com backslash insights into things. We do stream on Twitch five days a week at twitch.tv slash insights into things. And for links to all of our uh, different websites that we're on, also to find bios about us as well, you can go to our main website, which is insightsintothings.com. And that's it. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye.